Good morning. Uh, it's nice to see everyone. Um, so yeah, I'd like to start today's uh, talk with a question. So if you could give me a show of hands. Um, who here is currently working on a fiction project? Yeah, that's what I like to see. Um, all right, who here is a little bit of a worrier or a bit of an anxious person? Yeah. And of the, of the people who have not raised their hands, um, do any of you like small animals? <laughs> yeah, you got a few. So that's everyone covered then. <laughs> Great. Um, that makes my life easier. Um, so yeah, basically my name is Charlene. I'm from Singapore. Um, I'm just repeating my bio, sorry. Um, but yeah, I live in London. I've lived in London for 10 years now. Um, but I um, started my undergraduate degree in law, which is very, very boring. Um, but I did a, a module in creative writing. And then I worked for a few years. And um, after, after a short break, I did an MA and then the PhD. So that's, that's me. Um, but what I wanted to say was that um, creative writing sort of MA and um, sort of education, I don't necessarily think is like necessary as you don't, if you don't do that, you're not definitely not going to, I mean, so I'm something on my words. It, it is very, very good, but it's not the only way to get published. But for me personally, what, what really worked was giving me the encouragement necessary and also the community and the framework um, and also deadlines um, to work towards a longer project. So that's, that's what worked for me. Um, so what I'm talking about today um, comes from that viewpoint. Um, rather than one of um, me feeling like I have very sort of specialist magical knowledge to impart, what I'd like to share is my sort of journey as a quite anxious, overthinking person. Um, and I hope that you find some sort of usefulness and encouragement from that. So yeah. Who are you? Um, do you recognize these, these fellas? Um, so this, for the purposes of today's talk, I'm going to make a generalization. Um, I'm going to say that most writers um, fall within three categories, which you can see exemplified here. So I wish I had a pointer thing. I'm gonna, oh, I have a pen, so. So on, on the right hand side, this is the right hand side, you have Tigger. So the Tigger writer is really energetic and really productive and really upbeat. The kind of person that is like hashtag I'm writing can write like 3000 words a day. They'll be like, oh, hey Tigger, um, how are you today in the forest? Well, I just churned out 5000 words and then I went for a run. You're like, great, <laughs> good for you. And then in the middle, that guy over there, he's a bit like me in the mornings. Um, he's the Eeyore. The Eeyore writer is pretty melancholy, um, very in touch with his feelings, um, perfectionist, um, prone to imposter syndrome, and a little bit conforming to that sort of stereotype of the tortured artist. So they'll be like, hey Eeyore, how, how are you this weekend? Did you do any writing? Oh, I don't know. I kind of curled up in the hollow of a tree <laughs> and cried. <laughs> Um, so EOs, are, they find it a bit harder to be productive. And finally, you have this guy in the red shirt, Winnie the Pooh. Red, by the way, is also a power color. I don't know if you knew that. I read about that, yeah. It's, um, it's a strong color. But anyway, the, the Winnie the Pooh writer, um, in my theory, is a healthy combination of the two because I do think that you do need a degree of introspection um, to put words on the page and to express yourself that way but you also need to be able to have the sort of energy and the, the sort of kick to, to put, that, put that work into production and productivity. Um, so yeah, that's the three, three times, types of writers. You don't have to share which one you think you are. It's okay, it's quite a personal question. Um, but I, I can ask you um, which, which one, actually no, you, you, can, you can signal with your eyes, which one do you think I am? <laughs> you wanna guess? Okay, anyway. That's me. Yeah, I'm, I'm a complete Eeyore. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a total Eeyore sort of writer. So that's someone who's prone to being quite um, anxious, um, struggling with perfectionism, with not feeling good enough. Um, and and um, I think that the anxious mind is, is one that kind of 
excludes resolution, it's quite hard to, to, kind of, to kind of align a story into a plot, into a cohesive narrative, if the mind is darting all the time. Um, so <laughs> he's really big, isn't he? He's really sad. But anyway, um, I think that cycles of negative thinking are, are really counterproductive to creativity. Obviously, they hinder the creative process. Um, um, but what I do know is that um, I think we're all here because we love to write and because words give our lives meaning. And um, this is something that you know, we mean and feel passionately. But what I feel is not discussed enough or what I haven't been exposed to enough is um, sort of more openness around the fact that um, there are a lot of sort of psychological and sort of mental health conditions that go behind like um, processes of creativity. And I feel that if we were a little bit more open about them, then that would help us feel a little less alone in such a solitary process. Because a lot of the time when you're doing the work, it's just you and your laptop or you and your book. And some days you have bad days, you know, and I think if we were more open about that, then that would be more comforting. And um, also if we were more open about solutions to that. Um, so that's, that's what I'd like to go into today. Um, so yeah, before this talk, I also w watched some videos on TED Talks and how to give effective TED Talks. And I, I realized, but I watched it after I prepared th these slides and I realized that I did it kind of the different way. So you'll have to bear with me. I, I'm, I'm supposed to like walk around, for example, that's a <laughs> TED Talk thing. And I'm not supposed to refer to my notes, but oh well. <laughs> It's an Eeyore thing, what can I say? <laughs> um, so yeah, as I, as I was saying, um, I studied law, but I always knew it was not the route for me. Um, but it's kind of, I suppose if you grew up in an Asian family, I kind of wanted to please my parents, and my parents mean the best for me, and they were like, why don't you try it out? It's words, you like words. So I was like, okay, I did that. And I have absolutely no regrets about my undergraduate degree. Um, it, it taught me a lot about statutes, and stuff and, and how to like really squint at a page if it's really boring. So in contrast, what I do now, I, I, I write and I teach creative writing. It's like a walk in the park. It's, it's amazing. You know, even, even getting to stand up and talk about what I love, like writing and books is incredible. So like, and, and days like this, I mean, I, I, did, I don't think I had one like that when I was an undergraduate, but um, you know, events like this, industry days like this are absolutely invaluable. Like the kinds of connections that you make um, whether that's even to yourself or like what might spark an idea for you. Um, these kinds of things and this kind of exposure is really what we need to kind of sustain our sort of interest and inspiration because I think it's, it's a long haul thing, the whole writing journey. Yeah, I mean that in an encouraging and inspiring way. Okay, um, so yeah. This is what I'm covering. So yeah, the first, the first part of the talk, um, I'm going to talk about these sort of strategies for managing anxiety and um, other sort of conditions um, to do with mental health or like sort of psychological complexities behind meaning and idea making. And then um, I'm going to move on to um, just considering how and why we tell the stories that we tell um, and um, the difference between the stories that we want to write, like what we feel this kind of real desire to, what really excites us, versus stories that we feel obliged to. And I think obligation to me would fall under um, our understandings of what the canon or the syllabus or what the media or what sort of commercial pressures tell us is the kind of palatable narrative. You know, and I think that's, you know, we should ignore that basically. Um, easier said than done. And finally, um, a little bit about my experience being a published writer in the last year. Um, but from my viewpoint, so like a very sort of anxious, overthinking, overworried person. So hopefully that will be helpful for all. Um, so yeah, this is a quote from a Man Booker Prize and Miles Franklin Award winner, Thomas Keneally. He says, writing is an exercise in controlling your fear. Above all, the fear that you are not a writer, and the doubt is always there. But when the work is good, it delivers a sort of transcendence sometimes. I mean, I don't know if you've had this, but you know, when you have good days, you get really, really excited about the story, and, and you, know, you just want to keep rushing back to it, and it, it, doesn't really, it doesn't become a matter of word count, so like um, the time that you put in, because it's just so engaging. Um, and that's the kind of ideal state, I think what they call the state of flow, um, that 
you know, wish happened all the time. Um, so yeah, what I'm going to move on to is your first pair of small animals after Winnie the Pooh. Um, so the, the seal on the left is a good seal. I think he's the seal of like perfect productivity, like when everything's working out really well and you feel really calm and you've got your desk set up and you've got a time allotted and you're like, I am that seal, so calm. But then the one on the right kicks in. I don't know how seals, I think they bark and I'm not gonna do an imitation of one for you right now, but that to me is like the kind of seal that is sort of a barking seal of self-doubt, you know, it, it is, it is all the bad things. It's like, ah, oh, I don't know what to say. Maybe I, ne I never, don't know what to say. Maybe I'm not cut out for this, etc. cetera. Um, so the writing process for me is a balance between extreme conviction, maybe deluded that I have something to say and that I mean it really, really strongly. Um, and on the other hand, that seal, that one, um, which is like staggering, crippling imposter syndrome and self-doubt. Um, so I think for me, the process is veers between thinking that what I'm working on is special, at least to me, and amazing, at least to me. And most of the time thinking that it's terrible and like mortifying and like not fit for like anyone to look at. Um, so there are all these kinds of worries that compete with the impulse to create something and to write stories that hopefully connect with people. And um, I think that that's something that most people go through at some point of time or another in the process of drafting, um, the first draft at least. Um, so yeah, I do wish that I was more of a Tigger sort of writer or, or you know, the perfect combination of productivity and introspection. But I guess I have to kind of make peace with the fact that I am more of a warrior. Um, I've kind of, it's kind of ingrained in my thought processes and it's become inextricable from who I am and how I express myself. So it's that kind of weird thing. I, I suppose the contention of adulthood, you reach a particular age and you realize, okay, I'm not 12 anymore. I can't be, when I grow up, I want to be an architect with like a giant house. You know, it's kind of like I'm an adult and this is who I am. And that includes um, whatever anxieties or patterns of anxieties come with that. So I, I feel that it just becomes more about coping with that and managing that rather than trying to change who you are intrinsically. Um, so yeah, uh, Joan Didion has a famous quote. Um, she says, I don't know what I think until I write it down. Um, and I find that very true of myself. I think that there is one way of communicating, which is verbally, and I'm looking at all of you and I'm kind of like talking and talking. And then there's the other way, which is on the page. And I oftentimes find that I'm a lot more articulate on the page. You know, I prefer that page self. Um, so I think it's just a question of trying to be more productive and having more yeah, more, more work to kind of show for the fact that there's so much thinking goes on behind it. Um, yeah. My notes here say, if I spent the time doing sit-ups instead of doubting myself, I'd have an eight pack. Or if I, was, if I was writing instead of doubting myself or thinking about writing, I think about writing all the time, by the way, I'd have written about 20 books by now. I'd be like Joyce Carol Oates. Um, so yeah. and the perfectionism and the block. So um, this is a quote from the internet. I don't know who said it, but it's very good. The worst thing you write is still better than the best thing you didn't write. And I, I used to keep that over my desk because I find that so encouraging. It's, it's, it, I think it, it also signals back to a childlike impulse to play. So it's like, you know, when kids, they get Play-Doh or they get blocks, they don't care about someone taking a picture and publishing that, you know, they're not like, oh, you know, I'm going to patent this design. They're just like, I'm just having fun. Um, so I think this, this quote really speaks to that. You know, you have, you have 26 alphabet and it's yours to play with. You can create whatever you want. You can, you can, you can start a whole world. I mean, if you look at the kind of old structure of fairy tales, once upon a time, you have a time, you have a place, you have a tone in a, in a few words. There's a tremendous power to that. Um, so that's great. And um, the second quote is from Anne Lamott. Um, I don't know if any of you read Bird by Bird. Have you? Yeah, got some nods. It's really good, right? Um, so she says, the first draft is the down draft, so you get the words down. And the second draft is the up draft, so you fix it up. So I, I love that. 
I mean, most of the time I'm stuck in the downdraft. I'm just like, ah, oh, but <laughs> by the time I get to the updraft, yeah, it's a long time from then. Um, so yeah, I think these are ways of getting over the block, just the idea of writing what comes up. I think sometimes that takes the form of free writing exercises. Um, I've always been a journaler, so I, I write in a journal longhand. So even if I'm not necessarily adding words to my manuscript every day, which I really should, um, I am a bit of a graphomaniac, so I have to write um, longhand in a journal. And it's just my way of making sense of the world. But it also helps to filter out the really solipsistic stuff so that you know I make sure that the actual fiction is not too whiny and melancholy, basically. <laughs> um, and so yeah, basically, um, in terms of avoiding triggers, I think that quite a few of you shared that you are anxious, um, kind of overthinking at times. And I, I do believe that that is a tendency that we have to exist in, in very anxious times in general. Um, I think like with the current news cycle and with the kind of bombardment of new media, um, the fact that you can't really sit in a room uninterrupted you know, without that being sort of a willful act, you're like, you know, you have to decide to do that. It's just not the same anymore. The way how we think, the way how we communicate, the way how we receive information, often unintentionally, um, that, that really, really does change and affect, I think, like our neural pathways and our ways of, of trying to be quiet, because we, we do need to be quiet in order to create something. Um, so yeah, for me, um, I've had to really avoid triggers um, and I, I classify triggers as basically trivial internet wormholes. So say if you sit down at your desk and I'm just like, oh, typing or whatever. And then I'm like, oh, maybe I want to know what kind of lamp someone had in the 1960s. So then I open Google and the rest is history. I mean, I go into Wikipedia and then I'm just like, oh, interesting lamp deaths. And I'll be like, oh, types of lamps. And like, you know, so-and-so invented the lamp. And then I'm like, oh, Britney Spears, what's she doing then? And it goes on and on. And um, internet wormholes, BuzzFeed quizzes. Um, once when I was writing my novel, Ponty, I found myself um, in a wormhole of BuzzFeed quizzes. The first one was, um, what kind of like animal or something are you? And I was like, oh, great, I want to take that. And I was like, I'm not happy with the result, I'll try again. And then I, I did another one where they were, they were like, what kind of Game of Thrones minor character are you? And I was like, I did that. And I was like, I don't like the look of him. I'll try it again. And I was like, wait, I don't watch Game of Thrones. <laughs> what am I doing with my life? Um, so yeah, definitely. I know some writers advocate a program called Freedom, which shuts down your internet. Or there's also Stay Focused. I think that there are various um, programs like that. I don't use any of them. I basically just open the Word document and decide like, OK, whatever I have to look up, I'll look it up later. Um, and another thing, yeah, another distraction is snacking. Yeah, I snack, snack a lot, I think, especially if you're working from home. But that's fine. You know, you need fuel for brain power. Um, yeah, social media, that's a big one. Um, so I think the upside and downside of the internet is everything is accessible. You can find out. In a, in a matter of seconds, you know, whether in 1926 something actually happened. You can find out the name of a, I don't know, a particular, I don't know, what, whatever this technical thing is, you can, you can find that out in a sophisticated way. <laughs> you can, you know, you can connect with other people. And um, I think at times during the writing process, that's, that's really crucial to, to um, remind yourself that you're not sort of alone in, in the process of drafting and um, to kind of seek out other writers and have that support. But I think the downside of that sort of accessibility and the downside of social media really is um, what they call compare and despair. Um, you know, we're inundated with all kinds of data and all kinds of messages, success stories. And, you know, success stories are great and inspiring sometimes. But I think if you're not in the right frame of mind for them, they can be quite, you know, quite destructive. Um, for me personally, I had to quit Twitter. Um, but I think it really, really works for a lot of people and a lot of writers. But for me, because the medium was words and it was words, it was a bit, it was a bit um, sort of disturbing for me. I found it, I found it hard to deal with. Um, but yeah, so it's a matter, I think, of curating the sort of media and social media that you're exposed to. So my, yeah, Instagram to me is fine because it's very much image based. Yeah, so mine is mainly dogs, in case you're curious. Um, yeah, so. 
So yeah, an MA or an MFA is not necessary to get published, but if that's the route that you've decided to take, I think that it should be respected. Other people should respect it. It is just as sort of valid a route as any other. And I think it's, it's difficult enough trying to, to kind of make art and make stories in today's world, which is very, very much driven by these kind of timeless metrics, metrics of success. Like, you know, if you're not a doctor or a lawyer or like some kind of business person, if you go to a party and you say, oh, you know, I'm writing a novel, um, most of the time, or at least I've had the response of, oh, are you JK Rowling? Have I heard of it? I'm like, no. Or, or I'll also get, um, oh, you're writing a novel? Why don't you write about my life? <laughs> you're like, no, <laughs> you're boring. <laughs> um, um, so, yeah, what I learned from my MA, um, I took a break in between my undergraduate degree and, and my MA, and I, I worked for a few years in London. So I worked in business publishing because it was my way of getting as close to publishing as possible. I thought, oh, if there's the word publishing in it, it's kind of the same thing, right? Um, and um, I thought that, that breakaway was really valuable for me. It kind of um, really focalized my interests. I was able to sort of read for pleasure and, and figure out what kind of stories I wanted to tell. I have to say, I wasn't writing consistently. I just didn't have the time or I didn't know how to make the time at the time. You know, I was in my early 20s. And then um, I, I did my MA at UBA. Um, and um, that year was really, really valuable for me. Um, I think on hindsight that I was, I was quite clueless. I was really excited about going back to university. So I really, yeah, had a lot of fun with my workshop group. Um, but I met an uh, incredible, um, incredible set of peer readers and even if I feel that even if in an MA group people are not writing to your genre there's always something to be gained from everyone else's submission so like I feel like it, it's really really counterproductive for people to dismiss each other's work based on it not being their genre if you know what I mean um, I think that there's, there's something to be gained from every single piece that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And everything else is just basically commercial constructions of what is literary fiction, what is this, what is that, and what is saleable at a time. I mean, I think these things will change over time. So it's, I don't think there's much of a point cleaving to them too strictly. Um, so yeah, what I learned over that year was basically that I needed to write consistently because as I was saying, after I graduated, I mean, I've, I've written my whole life. I've tried to, but I haven't been consistent. Um, but what I learned from that year was, yes, that there is a necessity to be engaged with stories all the time. Um, so I think I, I take a little bit of more of a liberal viewpoint to that in that I, I'm not necessarily like 3,000 words a day or 1,000 words a day or anything. But when I'm working on something, I have to think about it every day. It's kind of like you get into a swimming pool and you have to swim around in it. And if you get out for too long, you won't be able to get back in. You know, you'll forget how to swim. I mean, that's a bit, no, you won't forget how to swim. So don't want to be too, don't want to be too dreary, sorry. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it was basically consistency. Um, consistency is key. I feel if you're not necessarily having the time to write like the serious writing, whatever you scribble down, any kinds of notes, that counts. And I, I felt like definitely developing a, a very good reading program was to me one of the most important things um, about improving as a writer, really broadening my, my reading range, reading people that I hadn't heard of, um, reading genres I hadn't heard of, you know, the, including nonfiction. And um, also, of course, the ability to handle and apply criticism. There's one thing handling criticism like in the room where you're just like, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then let you go back and look at the notes, you're like, whatever, it's perfect. No, so for me, it was just kind of doing the uh-huh. Mm. And then going back and like picking out what the common points were from the different sets of notes. So not necessarily taking everything literally, because in which case, you know, maybe nothing would be written or finished, but just taking out the kind of common points from your reading group and really sort of applying that, you know, considering it. Um, yeah, so for example, um, a common thing that I've gotten about my writing is I'm not necessarily the most plot-centric person. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> um, so now I'm, rather than taking that as a kind of weakness or, or an insult, I'm really interested in plot. I'm just like, what is, what is plot? And I, I still don't know, but when I figure out, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, the third point, um, reading, not just reading, but writing as well, it is to me a deeply private act. It is like, aside from the whole thing of wanting to be published and wanting it out in the world, I, I feel that I would keep doing it regardless because it's, it's just how I express myself. And, and it's deeply personal forms of, of meaning making. 
And I think as long as you kind of stick to the fact that it matters to you, I think that really, really comes across in the prose. It comes across in the language. Um, so for me, um, I find that particular novelists that I absolutely love, sometimes I'm just not in the mood to, to, to read them, to engage with them if I'm, if I'm feeling a particular way. So like someone like say Roberto Bolaño, you know, I have to be really, really sharp to, to read his stuff. Um, and there are other writers who I, I feel are a lot gentler and they, they're very inspiring. So I, I would count someone like Elizabeth Strout like that. She, she writes in such a simple but precise and beautiful way. And it's so, so empathetic or, um, the, the writer Yoko Ogawa. Um, and it's also interesting reading and translation, um, seeing that kind of art to that poetry and works in translation I find really inspiring. Um, biographies of favorite writers. So I really, really love Shirley Jackson. And I read her biography, I think early last year, and I felt so comforted by it. It felt like, you know, hanging out with a friend. Yeah, even though she's dead and never know me. Um, um, so the internet in that sense is great for finding books and communities at times. So, you know, the internet is wonderful for finding recommendations. Um, you know, it really has opened up sort of avenues of accessibility and it's opened up avenues for writers that might not necessarily get that coverage. Um, and I think there's real democratic power to that. So there's so much stuff out there. There's so many writers out there for you to discover that really might unlatch something. Like I feel that reading other writers is the most kind of inspiring thing because you just see how someone does something. They do a kind of shift in time or or they approach a subject that is really tired in a really fresh way and you think like, oh, that's so great. And it just makes you want to try that yourself. So yeah, the internet is great for that, for discovering writers, for literary communities. But I think um, I, I think like one shouldn't be sucked into factionalism. So basically don't be a literary hipster pretending to like great, great novels or highbrow texts just because you think it makes, it makes you sound smart or because that's what a writer should like. I think we should embrace the messy contradictions of our own tastes because our taste is what makes us special. Our taste is what makes us individual. Um, so yeah, just not getting sucked into factionalism. Also making peace with being a slow reader. I'm quite a slow reader and I have um, what I call a book hangover. If I really love a book, I can't just jump into another book. I kind of have to give that book a couple of days. Yeah, so that's fine, you know. I don't have to read 500 books a year. It would be nice. I often wish I had more eyes so that I could read several books at the same time, but I don't know. I think you'd all be really afraid of me. But <laughs> it's like hanging out with my tentacles. <laughs> um, yeah, on that note, making friends with fear. Yeah, this, so this is, um, this lion is called Bone Digger. This is his real name. He's in the zoo somewhere. And the, the Dachshund is called Milo and they're best friends. So the, this, this was meant to illustrate um, sort of making friends with or acquainting yourself with sort of writerly anxiety and fear. Yeah? I got that from the TED Talk tips. They were like, yeah, put an image because it's, it's like a, a good example. I mean, it, it's a good metaphorical, it has a good metaphorical weight. I think it does, but I hope they're okay. <laughs> All right. So, take your time. Okay. Yeah, so I've always thought of how the word authority has the word author in it. And, and the idea of the author and the figure of the author and also the writing self. And it always struck me that they were kind of separate things. Like the idea of the self that writes the stories and then the stories that meet the world. Um, there's just a kind of interesting sort of symbiotic connections between them. Um, so I was just interested in talking a little bit about that. So um, ha have, have any of you read uh, Elena Ferrante, the Neapolitan? Yeah, some people, yeah. So um, yeah, these, these are what are conceived as pretty sort of um, presumably autobiographical novels. There, there are four of them and they are incredible in, in their sweep and scope, um, very much about the political and social climate of Naples, but at its heart about these two girls, Lila and Linu, and I'm absolutely obsessed with, with, with these books because there's something so vivid and, and real about them. And it's, you know, it might be very much related to Elena Ferrante, whoever she is. So she's, she's anonymous. Um, it might very much be related to a real childhood, but um, she manages to write about these two girls in a way that is so relatable to anybody that has ever survived, like, you know, a kind of messy, complicated childhood. Anyone that's ever been shouted at by an adult. I think that's most of us. Um, so there's, there's so much 
to kind of unpack empathetically from these stories. And it's, it's to me the perfect combination of beautiful writing and like page turning, like compulsiveness. So that's, that's a sweet spot, you know. Um, so Elena Ferrante says, when I write, I draw on parts of myself, of my memory that are agitated, fragmented, make me uncomfortable. A story in my view is worth writing only if its core comes from there. So I, I think that's so true. Like, I, I may have talking, I've been talking a little bit about anxiety and fear, and I think that there's something of that impulse in that if you weren't afraid, then you're not doing something that is risky. And if you're not doing something that's risky, then what's the point of doing it? You know what I mean? I think like creative risk is definitely like part of that impulse to kind of tell stories and share them. Um, and the other thing about, you know, the, the kind of creative writing truism of, um, you know, write what you know, I don't think that, I think that is and isn't true. Um, but I do wonder where our stories come from, like the originating impulse of that, as Ferrante said, um, whether we're telling the same stories over and over. And I like to say that there's nothing wrong with that. I think every writer has the thematic territory. And also like territory can, can broaden and narrow as and when, you know, you could, you could generalize it. You could say you're writing about feelings. I mean, <laughs> that covers everything, doesn't it? Or you're writing about love or you're writing about pain. And, and that, that theme can keep coming up over and over again. And so what about it? That's fine. Um, yeah, so the hardest and scariest idea is often the one worth doing. Um, yeah, if you have a small voice that tells you you're not good enough to tell this story or you're not competent enough for it, um, you know, just shut it up and, and write something, <laughs> basically. Um, and um, I also have a very, very favorite um, quotation by Graham Greene. He says, what you remember comes out as journalism and what you forget goes into the compost of your imagination. So we are constantly kind of, you know, everything is research, like life is research, like sitting in a lecture theater in the morning is research. And we might not be aware of it now, but like, you know, this will find its way into stories in, in surprising ways. Um, so yeah, this, the late and great Toni Morrison says, writing is really a way of thinking, not just feeling, but thinking about things that are disparate, disparate, unresolved, mysterious, problematic, or just sweet. So like going back to the Joan Didion quote about, she's saying, I write to figure out what I think. So we might not necessarily know what we think about something right now. Um, and I think there is a real time lag between the experience of life and the work that comes out of it. So I feel that the novel that I'm working on now is a product of my experiences from the last few years. And, and the novel that I published last year is a product of the few years before that. It's kind of like a time machine. You know, I think it is quite hard to write about what's happening right this moment, because I think we need as writers the element of reflection, um, a kind of period of sort of quiet to contemplate what it actually signifies or what we want to signify of it, basically. Yeah, even nonfiction requires imagination. Um, so yeah, <laughs> like these cats. Yeah. Um, I went to a talk once by Ali Smith and she said something which has really stuck with me and really encouraged me. She said, everything is fiction. So even if you, even if you write in a journal, it is a form of fiction, fictionalization in narrativizing because life is not linear, life is messy, life is chaotic, you know, in trying to put it into some kind of order, that's a creative process. And I think even in biographies and nonfiction, you know, the, the, the authorial self is still a self that is separate from the living, breathing, talking you. So I found that that was very helpful because um, with students I've worked with and also fellow writers, I find this is more particular to female writers. They, we, we've often discussed, oh, you know, I feel like what I'm writing is kind of too trivial or it's not, you know, it's not important enough or it's not this or that. And also there's a tendency for female writers to often get asked, um, oh, you know, did you just base the whole thing on your real life? Is it, is it just like a thinly veiled um, autobiography? As if, you know, women's imaginations are undermined. We're not allowed to have imaginations, which I think is rubbish. <laughs> so yeah, everything, all forms of writing are imaginative. Back to Ferrante. Yeah, so she, she's talking about how feeling filters into the story and into the process, into the characters. Um, and the more distinctly that happens, that there is a kind of incisive effect of truth that kind of comes across uh, what she calls the graphic quality of that effect. 
the ways in which the writing achieves and enhances a lifelike effect. Lifelike, not necessarily from life directly. So I often tell my MA students that when they're writing in a way that doesn't engage, it's because they're trying not to sound like themselves. So it's, it's different between like sounding like yourself conversationally. And I, I, I think sounding like yourself in the way that you express yourself um, in fiction. And I think like sticking to that voice is to me what gives um, particular works that sort of resonance and clarity. So yes. Better to be brilliantly bad with your first novel than competently clone-like. And this Pomeranian understands. <laughs> um, and I, I really, really love this quotation because it's, it's, so, it's so sort of gung-ho and it's got a real sense of humor about it. And I, I think that now I th just think, you know, I'm not trying to be perfect. I'm trying to be brilliantly bad. Like I'd rather someone read, read this draft and was like, what is going on? This is insane and terrible, <laughs> but crazy than, oh, this is okay. It's kind of like well written, but bland. So yeah, never aim for bland, right? Um, so yeah, a little bit about process. So I think talking too much about a work in progress really takes the energy and the air out of it. So during my MA, uh, my, my fellow MA students and I would go to the pub and we'd have a lot of wine and we'd talk about our books, but the whole plot. So I'd be like, yeah, and then they die and then they, they end up somewhere, this and that. And by the time, you know, at the end of the night, we'd be all so excited. But then when we go to our desks to try and write, nothing. You know, it was almost like all the energy went out there. So I, I don't think that you, you should be talking too much about plot points whilst you're working on the text, because it's, it's almost like an energy, like a little ball of energy. And if you kind of distribute it too much, there's not enough like when it comes to the page. Um, and I think every single project has its own demands and ways of, of being. So I, I don't believe in didactic kind of 12 step structures that apply to everything. I don't believe in like, oh, you know, get up at 5 a.m. and eat a peanut and then write 2,000 words and run around the track like Tigger. <laughs> I don't think that's true, but that might be true for like the next project for someone else. So yeah, I think as long as you take your work seriously on your own terms, then that's all. Like methods, if a method doesn't work for you, don't force it. Um, yeah, many writers I respect hugely and find really prolific. Um, they, they all say it's all about putting the words down. You know, it's, it's about trying things out, um, throwing them out, more, more importantly, throwing them out if you need to. So I just, I just threw away like 30,000 words of a manuscript, for example, and it's fine. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I, I like to read writing, writing manuals, books on writing um, as a form of ca um, consolation, talismans against anxiety, but I also understand when I'm reading them to procrastinate. So something to look out for. Um, so, yeah, this is more encouraging stuff. If you fall out of love or faith with writing for a while, that's okay. You'll get back on it. Sometimes life happens. Um, yeah. <laughs> I wonder where ideas come from. Well, we've kind of discussed this a little bit, um, but Carson McCullers calls ideas illuminations and Elizabeth Gilbert in Big Magic, um, which I, I, I really encourage as a very encouraging sort of quite con conversational book about creativity. She talks about ideas almost in magic realist terms. She talks about them as almost like fairies that settle on your shoulder. And if you don't capture them, they fly away and you know go somewhere else. So I think that ideas, like the idea for a novel, the catalyzing thing is often a combination of two unlikely things, two juxtapositions that come as a result of thinking and, and knocking your head against the wall for a long time. So for me, um, with my novel Ponty, which is, Ponty is a Southeast Asian cannibalistic monster that eats men. And it's about a woman in the 70s in Singapore who acts as, as a monster in a series of um, B horror movies. So for me, it was the idea of the monster, the Southeast Asian monster. I tried to write a novel about that. I just couldn't get it to work. And then I, I thought of some other thing I've been fascinated with, which is kind of filmmaking and the idea of performance. So I kind of put the two things together and that's the story. So yeah, it's, to me, it seems like a combination of two things. Well, I was just going to show you a Bjork video, but I don't think we have enough time. Anyway, in this video, I'll just describe it. Anyway, she, she, she thinks up a book and then it gets printed by these magical trees and then everybody's reading it and it's great. <laughs> and you get to hear a bit of Bjork, but you, have, you can listen to it some other time. Anyway, that's not the reality. Well, this, this is a, 
actual printed book, which is cool. Um, but what I was going to say was, yeah, the, the actual experience is you think that after your book comes out, yeah, hopefully everyone will be reading it. You'll see all that stuff like, you know, printed out by magical trees. But obviously it's not it's not the case. <laughs> it's a complicated, rewarding and surprising um, experience. And um, yeah, I can't wait to hear from you guys. So I think we'll, what we'll do is we'll skip ahead to Q&A's now. Yeah. Thank you, Shelby, very much. Um, so how does all this sit with you as a writer? all this um, media stuff, presentations, meeting the agent, the publishers, oh. when you are a writer, it's a different view. That, 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 I think that's a great question because it's, like, it's like a two different selves, right? Like the kind of more public facing self of like doing talks and, and yeah, agent meetings and stuff and the private self, which is you and the page. Um, I personally don't mind this stuff as much because I, as I said, I'm a total Eeyore. So like my anxiety is like, I'm just like, oh God, like, you know, when I'm trying to write, that's when I'm, I'm terrified. That's, that's when all my fear comes out. So I don't mind this stuff as much. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Could you have imagined any of this before on to you? Um, of, no, no. I think that I did go through a period where I, I imagined what my covers would look like. <laughs> and I also imagined like like just very vague kind of daydreams, but no, not not at all. Like I, I didn't think that I'd be in Manchester, like talking to all of you. So this, yeah, this is really cool. <laughs> I enjoy this. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Can you describe a little bit like your your writing process? Like when you sit down and like just tell us about that. <laughs> you know, what what snacks do you have? What pens do you use? Oh, I mean, I yeah. I was, I was trying to get into that. Then I, I got, I told you about the BuzzFeed wormholes. Well, basically I sit down and I think, um, I think I'm very much led by feeling. So for me, when I write, and if I'm writing at home, I like to put on like non-instrument, like non, um, like instrumental music. So words that, like wordless music. And um, I just try and get into the kind of emotional impulse of, of, of the story really, kind of sinking into the story. So like, I think particularly when you're writing with multiple points of view, I always think of it as, yeah, you're getting into a swimming pool and you're kind of wading around. But to me, to me, I only hit the stride when I feel like I have that, I'm connected to that sort of impulse. To me, like, like stories are all about kind of animations of feeling. Like, I think like that's, that's like the, the kind of aim for me. Like every character has to have a yearning. They have to kind of want something, but not necessarily in ways that are overt. And I think like connecting to that emotionality is the key for me. Hello. Uh have you reread your book since it was published? Um, well, I've had to read it in events many. I've had to read sections many, 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 many times. So I have sort of, yeah, I haven't read it from cover to cover, though, frankly. I, I read it so many times during the editorial process. So I think I'm, I'm going to take a break from it for now. It's, it's all about the next thing. I hope you all found the small animals helpful. <laughs> Um, what are the main things you do when you are editing? This is a bit of a tricky question because I actually, in terms of how I intuitively write, I'm really slow and I edit as I go. So like sometimes I will take like ages on a line, but when I'm done, I'm done. So that was my old method of, <laughs> of working. Um, but now what I try and do is I write quickly and then I'll print it out and basically go over it with a pen. And I find like um, sense testing it, um, reading it out loud is oftentimes the best way. Yeah. So that, that's it. So like definitely printing it out in hard copy, going over it with a pen, reading it out loud, making sure it's okay. And then I think on subsequent, subsequent reads, um, just really trying to make sure that it justifies its place on the page. So like trying to make sure that everything, especially dialogue, things like that, they have to be working in multiple ways. Like it can't just be like, oh, hello, farmer, where are you? Oh, well, I'm so-and-so's son. You know, like that's, that's bad dialogue, that's exposition. So like trying to make sure that everything justifies its space on the page. Yeah. Um, I just wondered um, what sort of time frames you went from the first spark of idea of what uh, to... um, Well, the, I first started writing it and um, abandoned drafts. I wrote about this monster that was flying around and it didn't work. So I spent a year on that from 2012 to 2013 thereabouts. And then I restarted it in 2014, the end of. Um, so 2014 autumn, around October. And I finished it in 2016. 16 in October, so two years, 
two years, yeah. And then a whole year of editing with my editors. So it's a long process and it's also very collaborative. That's, that's what I wanted to say to everyone as well, like that your editors really, really help you shape the book. So yeah, don't be a perfectionist. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.